Well, come on, somebody, make some noise if you're glad to be in church today. Come on. Who's glad to be in church? You're looking good. Welcome. Welcome, Hilliard location, Polaris, Short North. If you're watching online or on television, we're glad to be able to bring this worship experience directly to you. And if you're joining us from one of the more than 350 prisons in 49 states tuned in right now today, come on, church, put your hands together as we welcome all of our family behind bars. You are not a project, you are a part of this family, and it is an honor to worship with you today. Uh, We are in week two of our series on the Holy Ghost, and I just want to cover just a little bit, what, what did we learn last week? We learned that the Holy Spirit is not a presence to be feared. He is a person to be known. Anybody remember last week? He is a person to be known. He's a he and not an it. And how we approach the Holy Spirit matters. And he is, he is fully God, and yet somehow he is uniquely different and, and set apart. And so we, we spent some time last week sort of unpacking this idea that, that we serve one God in three persons. Maybe you've heard of one God in three persons described or defined as the Trinity, the, the Holy Trinity. How can we serve one God in three persons? And, and what we learned is that we are loved by God the Father. For God so loved the world he gave. You are loved by God the Father. We are saved by God the Son. We are saved by faith through Christ, according to the power of his Holy Spirit. We are filled with and we are sealed by at the moment of our salvation, the moment you say yes to Jesus, you call upon Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven, you're filled with the Spirit, and he acts as a seal upon your heart. He seals you. So we are loved by God, we're saved by the Son, and we are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. We learn that the Holy Spirit is someone that the world cannot accept because the world cannot see him, nor does the world know him. But these are Jesus' words, and and this is an expectation that Jesus has for his church. Jesus is saying, if you belong to me, if you're one of mine, then, then you know my Holy Spirit. Because you belong to me, you know him. Why? Because he lives with you and he is within you. The moment you're saved, you're filled with the Spirit of Christ. You're sealed by the Spirit. We we learn that the, the Holy Spirit's name means breath, wind, the breath of God. First mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. As the the Spirit of God, the the breath of God hovered over the waters. And and from the breath of God, from the word of God, creation forms into the nostrils of man. God breathes the breath of life into man. And we became a living being. And and many of you last weekend, that's exactly what happened in your life. You received a breath of fresh air. You encountered the living God, the the Spirit of God. His his Holy Spirit was ministering to us last weekend, and we're just now beginning to scratch the surface. We learned that according to Jesus, it is for our good. Jesus said, it is for your good that I go away. For unless I go away, the Holy Spirit, my advocate, will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send my Holy Spirit to you. The only gift that Jesus promised would be better for his church, for you and for me, than than actually having Jesus right here with us in the flesh. We learned that being filled with the Holy Spirit is better than having Jesus right here with us, being present in the flesh, and that those who belong to Jesus are filled with the same Spirit that raised Jesus from death to life. And if the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he will raise your mortal body to life. And that there is literally, because we are filled, those who belong to Christ, we we the church, as we are filled with the spirit, there is literally supernatural power within you. Come on, somebody. There, There is Holy Spirit power inside of you because you are filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You are filled with Holy Spirit power. And so my question today is, what is Holy Spirit power for? 
That's a good question. Anybody think that's a good question? Well, well, what is the purpose for Holy Spirit power? When, when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you, what is the purpose for the power? He gives us the, the ultimate purpose in his very next line. He says, you will, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth, the, 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 the purpose for Holy Spirit power, it is to make us better witnesses for Jesus. That's the ultimate purpose for Holy Spirit power. When Jesus said, look, I've come for one reason, I've come for one purpose only, that is to make heaven full. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. That's why I came. And Jesus promised to build one thing. He said, I'm building my church and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Amen. Because my church will be filled with Holy Spirit power. And I've only given my church one mission and that mission will never be lived out, nor will it be fulfilled without Holy Spirit power. Not, not only will my church not fulfill the ultimate mission, but you and I, we will never be all that God has created us to be, nor will we do all that we've been put on the earth by God to accomplish for him apart from the work of his Holy Spirit in us. We need Holy Spirit power. Without Holy Spirit power, we are not strong enough, wise enough, brave enough. There, there is nothing attractive enough about any of us that will draw a desperate, dying world in need of Jesus to Jesus without Holy Spirit power. He is the fuel. He is the source of all the power we need to do all that God has created us to do. And that mission to make heaven full, that, that mission demands that we be filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that we be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we be led by the Holy Spirit, because this mission that we've been called to accomplish with Christ, this mission matters. Amen? It matters. This world needs Jesus. The purpose of Holy Spirit power, it is to make us a better witness for Jesus. It is, it is to strengthen the church. It is to make us more effective. It is to fuel and further the mission. It is to make the church the most attractive force on the planet. And the reason so much of the church has not always been the most attractive force in the world is I believe so much of the church continues to neglect the Holy Spirit. So, so much of the church continues to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're more concerned with falling in line with culture than we are following Christ. So much of the church has, has pushed aside the work of the Holy Spirit. We've neglected him in, 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 in such an awful way that, that there's very little attractive about a church. I would even submit there is nothing attractive about a church that is not filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what we need to understand is we have power. The church has power. We are filled with the Spirit of God. And, and yet to walk in Holy Spirit power, there, there is a participatory factor required to walk in his strength. We must choose to walk in his strength. We must choose to yield to the Spirit's work in our life. He's speaking, he's, he's moving, he, he's leading, he, he's guiding, he, he's strengthening, but we must choose to not neglect his work, but to embrace his work. We must choose not to follow the way of the world, but to follow him. We, we must choose to allow the Spirit of God to illuminate the Word of God in our lives instead of listening to all the other foolish words of the world. The world cannot accept Him because the world does not know Him. The world cannot see Him because the world is blind spiritually. But we know Him. We, we can see in the Spirit and by the Spirit. And, and when it comes to Holy Spirit Power. We, we need to understand what is Holy Spirit power for? It's to make us a more effective witness. But how? How does Holy Spirit power make us more effective witnesses 
for Jesus. I, I want to start with, with, with point number one, and, and that is Holy Spirit power gives us the power of salvation. The Holy Spirit gives us the power of salvation. And I've often said, as, as we've done teachings on the Holy Spirit, that the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit's work and presence in any church is not speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about that particular topic next week. So if y'all want to come back and hear that message, I, I would encourage you to lean in on that one. But the, the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in any church, it's, it's not anything spooky or, or weird or strange. It, it's simply our people being saved. Our people being saved saved? Are, are lost people being found? Are, are those who need Jesus being drawn to Jesus? If the answer is yes, then, then we can all thank the Holy Spirit for that. Because we don't have the power to convince anybody to follow Jesus. Come on. We don't have the power to persuade anybody to walk away from sin and to follow Christ, especially because it's becoming more and more difficult to follow Christ in this culture. We, we don't have the power to transform anybody's heart, anybody's mind, anybody's marriage, anybody's relationship. We don't have the power. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And then the, the greatest work and the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in any church is our, our people being saved. And I thank God that in this church, people are being saved every single time we gather, every single day. That's the Holy Spirit. He, he's the one that convicts the world of sin. He's the one that draws people to Jesus. If, 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 until you become overwhelmingly aware and convicted and convinced of your sin and of your need for Jesus, you'll never call upon the name of Jesus because you'll never be convinced enough that you need a Savior in the first place. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts the world of sin. It is his, his number one and, and most important gift. It is salvation. But there's a reason for salvation, and it's, it's not just simply to, to, to take us on up to heaven because, let's be honest, if the whole purpose for salvation was simply to get us on up to heaven, God would just go ahead and take us all up to heaven. There, there is more to our salvation than heaven. Though when we are saved, we are guaranteed heaven. Understand, when you're saved, you are not only being adopted into the family of God, you are being drafted into the army of God. We're not just adopted into the family, we're drafted into his army. You are commissioned, and the moment you're commissioned, you're put on mission, and that mission is to make heaven full. The church is given a mission, and that mission is to take back what the enemy has stolen. It's to reclaim ground that the enemy has taken, has captured. It's to go out and to rescue the lost, no matter the, the, the cost, whatever it takes. We are on mission to seek and save the lost. We are on mission to serve the least we are on mission to invest ourselves wholly and fully to kingdom work, to making heaven full. And the only way this world is ever going to be saved is, is when the church of Jesus, empowered by his spirit, gets absolutely insanely serious and passionate and intentional about fulfilling the only mission that matters. If you're saved today, you can thank the Holy Spirit. And if you are saved today, not only can you thank the Holy Spirit, but you can choose to yield to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, Jesus is, is having a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, is trying to feel Jesus out just a little bit without all of his other Pharisee friends finding out. So, so Nicodemus decides to head out in the dead of night and, and he finds Jesus. He reaches out to Jesus and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that, that you are a teacher who has come from God for nobody could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
Now, now some of you are, are familiar with that phrase, born again. You've heard that phrase, born again. You have been born again. But Nicodemus, this is a new phrase for him. Even though he's a religious man, he understands religious language. He, he's just not picking up right now what Jesus is trying to lay down for him. He, he, he needs some clarification. And so he asked Jesus, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Now, Jesus goes on to explain what, what this means, but, but being born of water, that, that simply is referring to being born physically. Understand the, the, the water breaks and the baby comes forth. You are born physically into a physical family. You're part of this earthly family because you've been born of water. But, but what God is saying is if you want to be a part of this spiritual family, it's, it's not just enough to be born of water. You must be born of the Spirit. If you want to belong to a spiritual family, you must be born of the Spirit. The, the flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And so when a person is born again, when, when, when you're born of the Spirit, you, you, you sort of look the same on the outside. That reflection is still looking back on you. Nothing really changes right away on the outside as, as, as your appearance goes. But, but on the inside, you're made new. On the inside, you, you've been transformed in the Spirit by the Spirit, which is why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says that, therefore, if anyone is in, in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And so on the outside, you still look like you, but on the inside, you've been reborn. And to yield to the Holy Spirit means to spend the rest of our lives learning to yield to him, to follow him, so that, so that this outside man can become just a little bit more like the inside man that has already been made perfect in Christ, by Christ, by his spirit. On the inside, you have Jesus, you, you look like Jesus, but on the outside, how many of you know we've got some catching up to do? Come on, we've got some work to do. That's why transformation doesn't start from the outside in. It starts from the inside and it works its way out. That's what it means to be born again. So if you've ever wondered, am I saved? Have I, have I been born again? Anybody ever wonder, am I, am I really saved? Did the, did the prayer really work? Well, was that moment really real? Well, just ask yourself this, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The, the Spirit himself will testify with your own spirit that you are a child of God. And one of the ways he does that is through conviction. Constant Conviction. Because if we're all honest, the moment we're saved, we don't suddenly look and act in love exactly like Jesus, perfectly like Jesus. And the reason sometimes I think we question our salvation is, is we're still stuck looking at the old man when, when, while the inner man has been transformed and made perfect. The old man still has a, a whole lot of imperfections in him. The sinful nature that I was born into wants to do evil all the time, which is opposite of what the Spirit wants. But the Spirit within me gives me desires that are opposite of, of what my sinful nature desires. And, and this battle at work within all of us who, are, who have been saved, born again, that, that conviction that we feel, that is some of the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit's continued work in your life. These two forces, the, the spirit of God within you and, and your sin nature, they are constantly at war with one another. Th this battle, it can be intense at times. And the more we choose to follow Jesus, the more we choose to submit to his spirit and understand that I'm not just saved by faith through Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit doesn't just give me the, the, the power of salvation, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power to, to literally walk our salvation out, to walk in God's will, to do what God says, to walk in faithfulness and obedience John chapter 16, verse 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will continue to guide you into 
all truth. He will guide you in all truth. Any, anybody else get, get lost in your own backyard? Anybody like me? Can Anybody directionally challenged in the room? Come on, raise your hand if you're directionally challenged. I, I'm very directionally challenged. I, I've, I've lived in the same house for the last four years. I can still get lost on my way home from church. Like, I can, I can run into to, to Mill Run and, and grab a pulp smoothie, and, and I still forget, do I live to the left or to the right? And most of the time, I'm, I'm wrong, so I'll do a U-turn in the road. I, I just get turned around so easy. Ma- matter of fact, if I would just do the opposite of what I think I should do when I'm in the car, if I think it's to the left, I should just go right. And if I think it's to the right, I should just go left. That, that I will always be right if I do what I think is wrong. <laughs> I'm very directionally challenged. And yet I think it's interesting that, that and this isn't to, to be boastful in any way, but, but I, I often think, like, like, God, why would you choose me to lead a church like this? I, I mean, we, we have a, a full-time staff that, that's pushing uh, nearly 100 people, and, and uh, we, we've got a church of thousands and thousands of people, and, and how can I lead anything with any amount of confidence when I can't even find my way home from church most days? <laughs> it's because I've, I've learned to hear His voice, I've learned to depend on the Spirit to lead me. I I wish he worked on the road like like he works in in life, to be honest with you. Listen, I've learned to not fall for the ridiculous wisdom of the world, but but to heed the word of the Spirit who will never contradict the word that was given in in the Bible. He, He will never lead us into contradicting God's word. The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and and he will remind you of everything that I have said to you. I've learned to hear him. I've learned to to surround myself with with godly counsel and and, and good and godly wisdom. Even though one time when I was really young, I, I literally got lost. I got trapped in my own bedroom closet. Come on, somebody. I'm not. True story. True story. When I was little, my, my bedroom connected to my parents' bedroom, and the only thing that connected our bedrooms was a shared closet. Now, how many of you know as a, a newly married couple, that's not the ideal situation <laughs> to have your bedroom literally connected to your kid's bedroom, but, but theirs was for a season, and, and the only thing that connected our rooms was a, a closet, a walk-through closet. And, and so one night, I, I, I got scared, and so I got out of bed. It was dark at night, and I started to make my way toward my mom to wake her up and tell her I was scared. And and so I walked through the first door of the closet, but instead of walking straight through the second door, I I must have just veered a little bit to the right because I walked straight into a wall and it was dark. Now, all I would have had to do is, is say, you know, just take one step to the left and go through the door. Your parents are right there. But I didn't go left because I never turned the right way on the road. I went deeper into the closet. I hit the wall. I went deeper, hit the wall. Now I'm in my, my mom's dresses and I'm, I'm in all of her coats and stuff. I'm getting all tangled up. And finally I turn this way, which is the complete wrong way. And now I'm in the corner. It's like I'm, I'm trapped. And, I'm, and so my mom and dad, they, they wake up and they find me in the back of the closet, just, just wailing and crying and screaming out loud. I'm, I'm stuck. I'm lost. How do I get out? The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. I feel like even in the church today, there, there are Christians who are living like you're trapped in a closet. You, 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 you can't decipher which way to turn. You, you don't know who to follow because everybody's got a word for you. Come on, culture has a word for you. Every show on television is all crap now. I, I, you can barely watch anything. It's, it's, there, there's, there's an agenda that's just working through and through culture. It, uh, ch- the, the, the enemy is working overtime to, to not just claim the minds of, of young people, but to trap them indefinitely. He hates us. He, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the only purpose the enemy has, to steal, kill, and to destroy. If he can steal, kill, and destroy, he's doing his job. He's living his purpose. But Jesus said, I've not come to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you may have life and life to the full. And though I'm leaving you in the, in the physical, I'm sending my spirit to you and he will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything I've said to you. 
which means when you learn to, to listen to his voice and, and, and you, you learn to study the word of, of God and, and you yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you, you don't have to pick up what the world's laying down. You don't have to fall for, for all of this untruth that, that so much of the world is, is falling for. And there is a lot of untruth that even the church is beginning to fall for. Because there are many even in the church who instead of being led by the Spirit are, are being led by everybody and everything but God. You're following a bunch of dead, blind people walking. You're, you're, you're falling for every trap and snare the enemy has set for you so that ultimately he can control your mind and your heart and, and, and try to mess up your life and try to get you off track so that he can make you a much less effective witness for Jesus. Church, let's not make it our goal to be accepted by the world. Let, let's make it our goal to be holy as he is holy. Let, let's make it our goal to be effective witnesses for Jesus. We can't do that. We, we can't be effective witnesses. We, we can't walk in the will of God apart from his spirit's work in our life. Here's the third thing the Holy Spirit gives. He gives us power to stand firm in our faith and to share Christ boldly. Now, you might wonder why is standing firm in our faith and sharing Christ boldly, why is that all in the same point? It, it seems like it might be two different things, but, but I, I would submit to you today that standing firm in the faith and sharing Christ boldly, it, they really do go hand in hand. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans, those who do not believe in Christ, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Church, church we, the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. That, that, that is one of his names in the scripture. And we, we've got to stop being concerned with are we going to be accused of, of being unloving or intolerant or this or that. Whatever label the world wants to put on us. No, no, no. We don't follow the world. We don't listen to that word. We listen to the word of God. We stand strong and we stand firm in the faith. And we can witness with our words. But an even better witness than your word is to witness with your life for Jesus. When, when your life becomes a witness for Jesus. As we stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. As, as we put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the enemy's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms as we put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, we may take our stand, stand our ground. And after everything we've done, we can still stand. Why? Because a fallen church is of no help to a fallen world. A standing church can lend a hand to a fallen world. And we need to stand. Let your life be a witness. Stand firm in the faith. Because it's not just your faith that's on the line. Your faith has the power and the potential to stir faith in others as long as your faith stands firm. I'll show you this in the scripture in Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, he issues a command throughout the land. Whenever you hear the sound that's played throughout the kingdom that, that he's determined that is your cue to bow and to worship this image. There was a culture within Babylon. It was a demanding culture. It was a conforming culture. It was the ultimate form of cancel culture because in the end, the king's command was bow or burn. You're gonna worship when we tell you to worship, how we tell you to worship, what we tell you to worship, who we tell you to worship, much like the world we're living in today. That, that same spirit of Babylon is still at work in the world today. Just because we don't live in Babylon, the, the Babylonian spirit is still at work in the world today. It says conform or be canceled. Back then it was bow or be burned. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they decide, no, 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 we'd rather burn than bow. But just so you know, O king, not only will we bow, we refuse to bow. We're not going to worship your, your idol. We're not going to worship your image. But, but just know you, you can try anything you want to try. We serve a God with power to save. And in the end, you, O king, 
You can try to have your way with us, and maybe you will have your way with us, but, but here's what we know. Our way is ultimately determined not by you, but by God. Only if God allows it can you have your way with us. And so they refuse to bow. And while everybody else bows, everybody else is conforming, these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their garments. They were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace, a furnace that had been heated up seven times hotter than it was supposed to be heated up. And because the king's order was so urgent and the fire overheated, the the flame of the fire even killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them in. They, 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 they heated up the furnace seven times hotter. The, 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 king was, the king's order was, was urgent. We, we've got to get rid of these men right away. Church, there, there was always an urgency to cancel quickly and completely those who dissent from the prevailing way and word of the world because the world knows the moment you start to tinker with its philosophy, with its ideology, with the world's religion, it all starts to fall apart. Nothing is able to stand or hold up because the world's way always leads to death and destruction and despair. So the moment we start to see anybody starting to dissect our way, we've got to cancel you. We, we've got to mandate that you fall in line. We, we've got to threaten you. We've got to torture you. We've got to speak against you. Whatever we can do to silence the word. And there's an urgency. We're, 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 we, we've, got to, we've got to get rid of you. The, the king, he's got to get rid of them. So these three men, they, they fell bound into the burning furnace. But the king, when he looked into the, the furnace, he was amazed, astonished, and he rose up in haste. And he declared to his counselor, did not we cast three men bound into the fire? Because I see four men unbound, walking, standing upright and firm in the midst of the flames. They are not hurt. Why? Because no culture, no king, nobody anywhere ever has power to do anything to you but that which God allows according to his purpose. And the king says, in, the, in this fourth one, appears to, to, to be a son of the, the gods. Try son of God. And see, what happens is their, their willingness to stand firm, even in the midst of the threat of death. They, they come out the fire, not even smelling like smoke. The king is so astonished, he, he makes a new decree. He says, any people, nation, language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego shall be torn from limb to limb. So he's not been fully saved yet, apparently, right? He's, he's, he, he's inspired, like, like okay, uh, y'all are lifting your hands. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm not really sure what this means. But if you don't lift your hands, you, you, we're going to tear your hands off your arms, right? We're going to lay ruin to your house, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Why? Because their walk became their greatest witness. Let let your walk be your greatest witness. Let the firmness of your faith speak louder than your words. What we know about the, the world where the world places its faith, when you place your faith in the wrong thing, your faith will fail. In a failing and falling world needs to see an unwavering church that stands firm with faith that can hold up the church and hold up the world that's falling. Let us say what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that I I thank Christ our Lord who has given me strength, that he would consider me trustworthy, appointing me to his service even though. There's always an even though. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus Christ who came into the world to save sinners of which I have been the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Let your life be an example for the world to follow. Now, there is a time to speak, and we ought to use our words, and it is, it is important to speak. Acts chapter 4, they, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they, they spoke the word of God boldly. 
And when we don't know what to speak, I, I pray all the time before I get up here, Lord, may I speak with the power and the authority of, of your Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to just give a message that, that I've, I've put together. I want to speak your word. And, and if you want to interrupt this message at any time, I, I want to speak what you want to be spoken to your church. I, I don't want to rely on my strength. I, I want to hear from you as, as badly as I want the church to hear from you. Sometimes it's, it's important to speak with our word, but may our life speak louder than our words so that when we use words, there's already something there that's attractive and becomes a, a reason, a, a hook for somebody to listen to anything you've got to say. Why? Because they, they've seen you stand firm. And it's Holy Spirit power that, that gives us the ability to walk in, in, in the Spirit. It, it's Holy Spirit power that, that gives us the power to live a holy life. When, when we're tempted by sin, it, it's Holy Spirit power that gives us the ability to, to break free of that temptation. When, when the temptations in your life that are no different from what others experience, when, when that temptation takes hold, know that God is faithful by His Spirit. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond more than, than you can handle so that, that you can stand when you're tempted. He'll show you a way out so that you can stand, so that you can endure. That's what Holy Spirit power provides. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sin all the time, but, but those who are controlled by the Spirit because we give him control, think about things that please the Spirit. If your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. But if the Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. So I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Maybe before you were saved, sin was, a, uh, was fun. You, you never really thought much about it. You just, you just lived how you want to live. You, you did what you want to do. And... You acted how you wanted to act. You said what you wanted to say. Treated people how you wanted to treat them. Because everybody else does and nobody else cares. And Sin is fun. When you don't know Jesus, sin is fun. The moment you know him and you're filled with the spirit, what happens is it's not so fun anymore. Why? Because I've got this constant nagging, this constant pulling, this constant conviction, this battle inside of me constantly reminding me, no, 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 no. You're lost in the back of a closet. If you would just take three steps to the left, now three steps forward, you're gonna find your way out of temptation and you're gonna find yourself in a room with some people who, who know you and love you and can help you and will support you and can pray for you. And if you just take a few steps to the left. I, I know you want to go right, but if you just listen to me, follow me, trust me. As we trust him and as we walk with him, the, the, this new life comes with, with, with some incredible new gifts. The, the Holy Spirit, he, he gives us power to make a difference with spiritual gifts. We don't have time to dive into all, all of the, the meaning behind spiritual gifts. I just want to say a few things about this. First is we cover spiritual gifts during week two of Growth Track. Week two of Growth Track is always on the second Sunday of every month. So Growth Track is a four-Sunday, four-step process. Step one is the first Sunday. Step two, the second Sunday of every month. On the second Sunday of every month, we, we do growth track step two. And in and, and part of that session, we actually take a spiritual gift survey together. And that gift survey is meant to help people identify their unique and God-given spiritual gifts. Gifts of the Holy Spirit that are distributed according to the will of God. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4. That, that God would give them as he will spiritual gifts. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that are given not just to some, but to each of us as a means of helping and strengthening the entire church. Now, if you want to read about spiritual gifts before you, you get to step two of growth track, go home and, and read Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There, there are lists of spiritual gifts 
gifts. I, I would say this, that if you're, you're curious, you, you, ought to, you ought to dive into this. If, if you want to know how God has uniquely wired you, you, you ought to take some time to, to study this out. Because God doesn't give you a gift without a purpose. So I believe not only will you never live the fullness of the purpose that God has for you until you know and begin to use your unique and God-given spiritual gifts, but this church and the Big C Church will never be all that we've been intended and created by God to be until every part, every member, every person in his church, until every part of the family knows his gifts and her gifts and uses his gifts and her gifts to, to strengthen the church that we might become the most effective witness on earth. So I'm going to ask you the same three questions I asked you at the end of last week's message. Number one, will you commit to trusting God with your whole heart? Will you, will you commit to trusting God with your whole heart? Whatever thoughts you think you have of the Holy Spirit, whatever you think you know about spiritual gifts, whatever, whatever you think you know about being filled and strengthened and empowered by the Spirit of God, would, would you just lay that down for, for the next week or so and, and, and just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you, whatever you have for me. Whatever you want for my life, whatever gifts that, that you, you've desired that, that I become aware of and that I use, I'm going to trust you. And then would you commit to just, look, I'm not going to take this for granted. I'm, I'm not going to take you for granted, your, your, your spirit for granted. I'm, I'm not going to grieve your heart. I'm not going to break your heart. I'm going to learn. I'm going to study. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to pray. I'm going to set aside time each day to, to just entertain you, to just dwell upon you, to just be in your presence. It, it might just be a few minutes of every day. It might just be five minutes before you, you leave for work. But, but Lord, I'm, I'm going to take five minutes and, and, and just, just be in your presence. And, and I'm just going to ask you to speak and, and to remind you that, Lord, I'm willing to, to follow you and I'm longing to hear from you. And will you commit to seeking him? With all your heart because his promise to you is you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart I, I will be found by you declares the Lord and God doesn't make it hard to be found by you and me matter of fact Jesus fully God chose to become fully man the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus said, if you want to know what God looks like, just look at me. If you've seen the son, you've seen the father. He didn't make himself hard to find. He left the comfort of his throne in heaven to be born in a lowly manger, to live with the purpose of laying down his life for you and for me. And he died on a cross that, 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 that should have been reserved for you and for me, for my sin and your sin. But he took upon himself our sin so that he could break the power and hold of sin over us. That anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved and filled with his Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you, we're going to prepare to pray together, but we're also going to take communion together. I'm, I'm hoping y'all y'all have the elements of, of communion in your hand. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. Today, I, I want to do this not only in remembrance of Jesus, but I want to I take communion today in remembrance of Jesus and in awareness of his Holy Spirit's work in our life. Let's not just remember him like, like he's somebody to be remembered, but he's not here anymore. No, let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus and the, the resurrection of Jesus. Let's celebrate who he is and what he did, what he's done for us. But let's, let's be aware and let's celebrate and let's dwell upon in this moment the, the inner working of his spirit in our lives. Would you take the bread in your hand? Some of you, you're just going to pray with me. Some of you, you're going to be saved right now. If you're not saved, you've not been forgiven, you're not filled with the Spirit while, while you pray with me today. If you would put your faith in Jesus, you're going to be saved. And you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God. Just hold that bread and say, Jesus, thank you for choosing, though you are fully God, 
to become fully man, to walk among us, live among us. Thank you for being tempted the way I'm tempted, for suffering and for sacrificing your life for me. Because you were beaten and you were bruised and you were betrayed and you were condemned, I can be healed, whole, free. Would you eat the bread right now and say thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. With the cup in your hand, would you say, Jesus, I thank you for the blood you shed on that cross. Blood that covers every sin. Forgive my sin, cleanse me from the inside out. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I I put my faith and my trust in you. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for the work of your spirit in my life. Would you drink the cup? Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you're saved. Many of you, you you prayed that prayer years ago. You've been saved. Can Can I encourage you? Listen to me, church. If you were saved just now, or if you've been saved for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but you've not been water baptized, can I just plug real quick? This Friday night at our Polaris location, church wide, at our Polaris location is six o'clock on Friday night. We're doing water baptisms. So you can sign up today. You've got some time to invite your family and friends to join you. It's gonna be a party. I believe the Spirit of God is gonna move powerfully on Friday night. At that one location, a whole church is gonna be joined together. We're all gonna be there. So if you've not been baptized, would you, would you make it a point to say, Lord, I'm going to take a step and follow you. I'm going to be obedient to your word. I'm going to heed the work of your spirit because I'm telling you, if you're saved, he's leading you. If you're saved, he's prompting you right now. You're thinking, you know what? I've not been baptized. I need to be. I probably ought to be. I've got lots of reasons why I might not want to be, but you know what? I'm not going to listen to my reason. I'm going to listen to your spirit. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to honor you. Would you do that Friday? night at six o'clock. Come on, stand up on your feet as we continue to worship Jesus right now.